morning. Good, morning. Good to see you here this morning. It is the first Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday of December this year. It's hard to believe it's already December. Things are relatively quiet unless you're in choir and then you're busy as you're, they are practicing for the cantata at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve night. So do please um, pick up a sheet, take it, and invite somebody. I don't care if you know them or not. Invite a stranger. But let's get the word out and see if we can't fill the sanctuary. All right, Jenna, I'll get it. so that the mountains would quake at your presence. 
as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. In the midst of our own encounters with uncertainty and upheaval and our longing for deliverance, Jesus calls to us, Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. That's Mark 13, 35. And now I ask that the congregation join me in the response for the next part found on the screen or printed there in your bulletin. <coughs> we wait as people surprised again and again by God who shakes us out of our complacency and wakes us up to the work of the kingdom all around us. We light this candle as a sign of our shocking hope. May we stay awake to God's activity in the world as we wait in expectation that even now God is with us, working to restore us to the fullness of life with God and one another. Amen. You're going to have a sung response each week. It's lift up your heads. You mighty gates 213 in the hymnal, verse 1. So as the person returns to their seat, I'll give Paul his cue and we will sing.
Let us pray. You are the God who comes, the God who created us to be your companions, the God who showed up when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, the God who sent your Son to come among us, to be born as a baby, to be vulnerable, to put on our flesh, and to teach us and show us and love us into the ways that you hope to find when he comes again. We thank you that you are the God who is present throughout our lives and into eternity. We give you praise and thanks for the ways that you offer salvation to each of us. And Lord, we ask that you call us to be your church, to live in such ways that others see your light and are drawn to it. Lord, we ask that you be with those hoping for, waiting for transplants. We give you thanks that Tyler received his and ask that you be with him as he recuperates. Give hope to the others who are waiting. Heal Jason from this infection that the right things may happen and his transplant may take place. We pray for Lana Fair, who is facing an upcoming procedure, that all will go well, that the medical staff and team will make the wise and the right decisions. We thank you for the mental help and recuperation that Chuck has experienced, and we ask that you help him to strengthen his body. We do pray for Melissa. She deals with a sordid health things. We continue to lift my grace in our prayers as she's struggling with some health issues. And we lift to you those who we have not named but who are dealing with health issues, who are facing diagnoses that are hard, who are struggling with the effects of aging, who are not, don't feel well but aren't sure why. For those who suffer with mental health issues. We lift all these to you because it is your healing light shining within them, through us, that can help them face each day with hope and with courage. And we lift to you those who are grieving. We ask your comfort upon their family and friends. We ask that many good memories are drawn out and brought to mind that they might remember them with smiles through their tears. We thank you that in you, their love may continue into eternity. Lord, we pray for our friends over at Premier Solutions as things are winding down and they're dealing with end of the year stuff. Let them know that they are our friends and they are in our thoughts and our prayers. Lord, as we enter Advent, let us give you the gift of attention, of presence, of time. And Lord, let us prepare our hearts, our minds, our lives for the fact that you may come for us tomorrow, next week, or not for years yet. Let us live as those who are ready to greet you whenever it is that you come. We thank you and we praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. The Lord's Prayer now, or let us join together with the confidence of children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
against us. And lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Gospel this morning, so I will ask you to remain standing. Jesus and the disciples were leaving the temple in Jerusalem one day, and the disciples were looking at the amazing construction of the temple at the size of the blocks that it was built from, and kind of praising that. And Jesus warns them that this temple will not last forever. And there will be destruction, and there will be unholy things that happen in the temple. It will be desecrated, but his word will stand forever. And this 13th chapter of Mark becomes Jesus' farewell discourse to the disciples in the Gospel of Mark. And he goes on to say to them, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heavens, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, from the ends of heaven. He says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with their work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Think back a moment, back to your school days, probably high school or possibly college, if you were a college student. Did you ever take a course or perhaps even a training as an adult where you were graded only by a final exam or project? Oh, you do. I don't. All that you did through the quarter, through the semester, didn't matter. It came down to that one final exam or project. I don't remember experiencing that. I'm very grateful because I probably would have tried to cram in the whole semester's worth of knowledge at the last minute to pass the test. And some who experience test anxiety who would know the knowledge but struggle with tests, they would be in trouble. And it'd be awesome. So Jesus is telling the disciples it's not just about the final it's about living ready. We know that Jesus is merciful. We have his gospels in front of us. We know that on the cross, he told the thief that repented at the very last gasp of life just about that he would be with him in paradise. But today, he's teaching that those who truly follow him are not to cram at the last moment or wait until then to ask for mercy, but to live faithfully in the meantime. One more note about today's reading, his warning to the disciples that the physical temple, this building where they had known the presence of God would be destroyed, also leaves the locusts of those who had faith in God from this building 
they considered the home of God to the home of God in the word in Jesus Christ. So he is stating his word will endure no matter what happens in the temple or the city or in our world. And then he goes on to teach the Son of Man will return with great glory and gather up those who have been faithful at that time of second coming. But he also specifies very carefully that no one but God the Father knows when that day will come. Douglas R. Hare wrote a commentary on Mark. He says that those who try to calculate the exact time of the second coming are being arrogant and claiming to know more than Jesus. Sometimes the commentators can be kind of pointed. <laughs> so we don't know. He says it's grace that the second coming hasn't happened because our world is not ready for it. Too many do not know Jesus. And Jesus goes on to tell this story, kind of a little story. He says the master is leaving the slaves in charge while he is away, and the doorkeeper in particular is who he's talking to, but the slaves know what their work is and what they are to do. And the master might return at any time of day or night, which would be unusual because traveling didn't happen much at night in those days. Jesus always likes to see if you're really paying attention. But he took those Roman military hours, and the four times that he mentioned would be the kind of changing of the guard, I think, the military watch. As an example, the servants have been given their work. They know what it is. They are to be found ready when the master returns, whatever time of day it is. Last week we celebrated the reign of Christ Sunday, considered the story of the sheep and the goats being separated at the end of time. Those who cared for those in need in various ways were the ones who said Jesus who, excuse me, were the ones who Jesus said took care of him, and they were to be rewarded. But the ones who didn't care for others were to be cast out. The servants of Christ had been given their assignments, kind of summed up in two ways. One is at the end of Matthew, we are given the Great Commission. We are told to go and to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the other is repeated through the Gospels when Jesus is asked about an important commandments. He said the most important commandments are kind of two rolled up into one. Love God. Love others. Because it is by loving others that you show your love of God. And so the assignment for Jesus' disciples then and still today is that we love God, love others. Loving others well is how we can go about making disciples. Because when we reach out to those who are lost, to those who feel excluded, to those who are in need, we are sharing the love of Christ to them. Sometimes the opportunity rises to tell them of the love of Christ and invite them to know it for themselves. So we as Jesus' servants want to be reaching out. We want to be found living faithfully when the second coming occurs. This season of Advent, Advent means coming. We watch for the coming of Christ. We remember how he put on flesh and came as a baby into the world as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, excuse me, those two words together. Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that he, when we celebrate his coming, his birth on that night we now call Christmas, Christ's Mass is where Christmas derives from. We also know that he comes into our lives through the Holy Spirit to allow us to know he is present with us. We are not alone. He comes to us in the bread and the cup to strengthen us as we stay awake and watch for his second coming. He comes to us in those who come to us needing help and support. And there are other ways. Christ comes into our lives in many ways. 
And we do believe, and we think about at this season, as we think about his coming, we think about the second coming, that Christ will one day come again and establish his reign fully on the earth. God's will being done throughout all of creation, justice and peace and righteousness reigning forever. So we watch, not sitting on our hands or our backsides in the pews, but actively waiting and watching. And we stay ready by praying, by loving our neighbor, and even by loving our enemies. We wait actively by being about the mission of loving God by loving others and making disciples. Today we know that Christians have waited much longer than a generation for the time of the Second Coming. Some ways it might be harder for us to anticipate or wait with longing because it seems like it's so distant and unlikely. And yet, yet we also know that sometimes our life may end suddenly and we are facing Jesus even before he returns to all the earth. And so we again Try to live faithfully and ready. A story is told of one of the New England state legislatures in colonial times. So it was a couple hundred years ago. They were experiencing an eclipse. Things had gotten very dark in the middle of the day. Some of the lawmakers were panicking. Some thought they should adjourn and they should go home or maybe it just tied under their desks. Finally, one stood up and he said this, Mr. Speaker, if it is not the end of the world and we adjourn, we shall appear to be fools. If it is the end of the world, I should choose to be found doing my duty. I move you, sir, that candles be brought. What an advent response. In spite of things suddenly going dark, Let's stay here. Let's do what we are supposed to be doing. Bringing some candles. <clears throat> doing my duty. Living out my responsibilities. This is the kind of Advent waiting that we are doing, that we are looking for. We watch for the coming of Jesus. But in the meantime, we are found doing our duty. Not because doing our duty means that we earn our salvation but because it is our love response to the love and grace that have been poured out for us and all humankind in Jesus. So today as we join together in communion, another word for communion, the Greek word is Eucharist, Thanksgiving, let us give thanks for the grace that invites us to take Jesus within us because he comes to us, to strengthen us in our living and loving and give us a glimpse of the new life offered in Christ's second coming. My favorite part of communion might be the invitation. We get to be at the table of Jesus Christ. In our tradition, no one is turned away. There are no preconditions. If you desire the love of Christ in your life, you are invited to this table. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church. You are invited to take in the life of Christ within you once again. Let us go forth with eyes to see and let us see Christ in everyone that we meet. Let us go forth to love God and love our neighbor in all that we do.